The main character wonders how long he has been in this abyss, and most frighteningly, he is waiting for death. Currently, he remembers only fragments from the past. People openly told him they hated him and wished Norman dead. He also remembers the desperate cries of his loved ones. At this time, his soul was shattered into small fragments, and it seems that he was trapped in a permanent curse. Norman kept hearing calls for him to get out and just die. He believed that death was the only way out, but he did not want to die like that. This curse continued until the beautiful voice of the girl brought him to his senses. And it was then that Norman swore that he would devote his whole life to protecting the person who saved him. The designated Imperial City celebrated the 500th anniversary of the founding of the Empire. Finally, after ten difficult years, this time came, and the girl confidently stepped forward on the square. Lotan's people looked at her in surprise. The girl who was the object of amazement of all present was Alicia Melfont. She rejoiced at her magical return and noted that her house was still there. These were surprisingly fertile lands due to the favorable climate. There was an estate in its prime and where the soul rejoices. A distinguished family lived in the estate, where famous knights were born for many generations. The heroine remembers her family, namely her parents, who were well-known aristocrats in the West, and her brother with his most pleasant wife. The little girl simply adored her family, which was always nothing but joy for her. The heroine also remembers how one morning her father brought a new family member to their house. He informed that from today she will live with them. It was a cute girl with golden hair named Ophelia who possessed divine power. The girls immediately became friends, and the main character was very happy that she had a sister and a friend. Ophelia often complimented Alicia, who was surprisingly beautiful, especially with this wreath of flowers from Teresia. Alicia was so happy about everything. Life seemed so beautiful to her in those moments. She was sure that the goddess Mayera was smiling on them. The whole family was so happy, and it seemed like it would last forever. But one day, black clouds hung over the estate. It all started when a guy named Nix visited them. Alicia immediately noticed something strange and repulsive about him. However, Ophelia, on the contrary, was very kind to him. She led him to the house, despite the heroine's protests. And this was her only, but such a significant mistake. Nix always followed her wherever she went. Alicia, remembering those moments, chastises herself for not being able to discern his true intentions in time. It turns out that he needed not Ophelia herself, but her divine gift. In reality, the young wanderer Nix was a vicious priest who worshipped the god Arfo, who was known for his dark power. Nix wanted to take possession of Ophelia's divine power, which could help bring the god Arfo out of sleep. But instead, he caused the dark forces of the god Arfo to fall upon the estate, Thousands of people became victims of the ritual. The heroine's family was not spared either. Relatives shouted that at least Alicia could be saved. In a moment, Alicia lost everything that was important to her and that she loved so much. When after all, the heroine came to her senses, she was almost alone in a large, empty estate. Only her little nephew, Alford, was around. She saw her father's memorial ring on the floor. Left with only the baby, she promised herself to do everything to survive. She also vowed that day that she would definitely restore the Melfont estate and her family name. Nephew Alford will receive her father's ring as the sole heir of the family. Ophelia simply ran away during those terrible events, leaving the named sister to die. But Alicia points out that it was thanks to her anger and hatred for Ophelia that she was able to become who she is now. To get back on her feet, the heroine got rid of her pride and became a wine seller. And only thanks to dedicated work, she was able to restore the Melfont estate in just ten years. Those around her noted the size of the jewels on her and guessed their value. Envious people whispered behind her back and secretly called her a witch. They laughed at her because she called herself an aristocrat, but in fact she got such a fortune from selling wine. Alicia, on the contrary, invited men to Romdak in her free time. She promised to show them the jewelry, although it was made only for members of the imperial family but she immediately added with a sly look that she doubted that they would have enough money to buy them. She further added that these evil people are only capable of spreading gossip behind their backs. Alicia thought that the privileges of the aristocracy meant nothing to her now. She just confidently goes her own way and paves the way for her nephew Alford until he grows up. At that moment, everyone around them opened their mouths in surprise, looking at the fireworks. Alicia, on the other hand, considered fireworks a waste of money. She was concerned about where their taxes were going. Unexpectedly, everything around shuddered. An explosion occurred. Alicia couldn't figure out what happened. She understood that there was no time to waste, and she needed to get out of there urgently. 
For a moment, she thought she understood what had happened, and a strange feeling came over her. But no, she refused to believe it. A rather familiar young man appeared in front of her, who addressed her by his full name, and ironically said that they had not seen each other for a long time. Of course it was Nix. He called Alicia a stubborn girl because she still managed to survive then. Alicia responded by hysterically yelling for him to be damned, but she was able to control her emotions. The girl told Nix that he was also lucky, because she heard that the priests also mocked him on that terrible day when he killed her parents. The dialogue continued between them. Alicia expressed her hope that for a long time she thought that his corpse had been rotting somewhere for a long time, and he noticed her unchanging sharp tongue. Finally, Nix asked the heroine where she was and where did she hide it. The girl did not understand who it was about. He explained that he was interested in Ophelia and asked if she was here. Alicia just hated him at that moment. Another unpleasant blow for her were the mentions of Ophelia. She decided that there was some way to keep him here until the priests arrived. The girl addressed him as a miserable animal and asked if he really didn't know anything. Quite unexpectedly, an idea came to her and she said that Ophelia had died that day. Nix looked very confused, and Alicia was glad that her plan had worked. But the boy instantly changed his face and cunningly stated that it was a lie. Alicia looked furious and refused to believe what was happening. Nix activated his dark power and acted on the poor girl. Her life was in danger, and before she lost consciousness, she managed to mentally note that she was again putting herself at risk precisely because of Ophelia. When Alicia was able to open her eyes, everything around her was floating, and she could not understand where she was. She only heard a voice nearby, which ordered someone to keep their eyes on her and wait for a command from Mr. Nix. Lying on the floor in shackles, she wondered with horror what was waiting for her next. The girl began to force herself to get up, because she cannot just die here. She remembered that she was responsible for baby Alford and could not leave her wine business. After some time, the heroine was able to get out of the bars and ended up on the lake. She did not understand what was happening, but thought that it was all a dream. Next, Alicia saw that there was some wonderful book floating in the middle of the lake. This surprised her even more. The heroine took the book in her hands and analyzed in her mind, what else can be strange here? On the cover of the book was written its strange name, Night of Ophelia. The heroine was covered with memories, and she decided that a funny story cannot be described there, judging by the title of the book. But when Alicia opened it, she realized that it was written about her life, the events that happened that terrible night were described in detail there. It was about how exactly Nick sent the curse on the Melfon estate. It was also said that when all this happened, Ophelia immediately rushed to help baby Alford. Then, judging by the book, she went to Alicia's sister. But when she approached her, the life forces had already left the girl and passed to the dark god. Alicia was surprised by what she read, but she did start to remember something. She remembered how the demon's hand grabbed her and she died for a while. Ophelia at that time activated all her divine powers to bring her sister back to life. With the remnants of such powers, she sealed the young Nix who was overthrown. It would seem that after this, as Ophelia was able to defeat the messenger of the Dark God, peace and tranquility will follow. Ten years later, however, Nix's men found a way to free him. God's servant Arfo woke up after a long sleep and first of all decided to find Ophelia. Reading the book further, Alicia was surprised to learn that Nix came to the capital because he felt Ophelia's divine power in her. Now she understood why he was asking about her like that. She decided that she could use Ophelia's power to strike Nix. She didn't understand how she could do that, but she decided that by reading further, she could find a clue in the book. But then the girl realized that she had not noticed one important detail. The fact was that Judging by the title of the book, Ophelia, not Alicia, was the main character. Nick slaughtered the Imperial Army and built the Citadel of Tantaros in the far corner of the kingdom. He hid there and tried to trap Ophelia by sending her pieces of Alicia's body. Finally, Ophelia appeared to him. She begged him to stop and leave his sister alone. But the crazy guy cut Alicia's throat right in front of Ophelia, thanking her first that it was thanks to Alicia that he was able to lure the victim here. Reading about these events in the book, Alicia thought with horror, what does it mean that she will die? The heroine shouted hysterically that she did not agree with this development of events. She did not intend to die because she had the divine power of Ophelia. With its help, she will be able to heal any wound. According to the plot of the book, the power of light immediately returned to its owner after Alicia's head fell to the floor. Ophelia became even stronger at that moment. 
having strength not only of spirit, but also of mind. Gaining even greater power, this time Ophelia sealed Nyx away forever, thus preventing the return of the dark god Arpho. This is how the story of Ophelia, the girl who saved humanity, ended, Alicia cried, because she understood from the book that it was she who had to die so that Ophelia would survive. But she immediately pulled herself together and decided to fight, because she did not agree with such an ending. Continuing to read, the girl reassured herself that it was just a terrible dream, and she should wake up already. Alicia tried to come to her senses as soon as possible, because her little nephew Alford was waiting for her. She will also be needed by the people of Melfont. But she was still in chains and did not understand why this dream did not end. While she was behind bars, Alicia heard the cries of people begging for help. They were prisoners to be sacrificed to the dark god Arpho. She also heard Nyx cajoling people and saying that they would be sacrificed for a good cause. And then she understood that it was Tantares, the place where Nyx sat and hid. Being in chains, Alicia thought everything that was happening was quite strange, because everything was going exactly as described in the book. And then she realized with horror that this is where she could die according to the plot. The heroine forbade herself to give up and ordered to find a way out. Alicia mentioned that if the book is to be believed, she now has Ophelia's divine power. All that remained was to figure out how to use it. This will allow the girl to escape. She hoped that this power would even help her harm Nix, and he would pay for what he had done to the Melfont family. Unexpectedly, she heard a voice that asked if it was that girl's camera. Time was short, so she tried to think of how Ophelia used her powers. The girl cursed because nothing came to her mind, and they could grab her at any second. In the next minute, she concentrated and mentally asked Ophelia to help her. Nix's men wondered at the sound they heard. They thought with hope that it was the god Arpho who was coming, hearing the prayers and appeals of their master. They decided that it was necessary to urgently deliver Alicia to Nix so that he would not be nervous. Entering the dungeon, they saw a girl sitting, freeing her hands by herself. The attendants looked surprised and excited. Alicia informed them that she was going to make hell on earth for them. The heroine began to do incredible things. It finally dawned on her that Ophelia's divine power was really inside her all this time. Feeling an incredible surge of strength, she decided for herself that she would fight to the end and not accept the ending that was described in the book. In the confusion that she herself had caused, the girl did not immediately notice how she flew several floors and landed below. She gathered all her strength again and decided that the most important thing now is to get out of here. Thoughts were confused in her head, and she forced herself to find a way out as soon as possible because little Alford was waiting for her. Here Nix's people saw her and decided that they needed to catch up with the girl quickly. One servant managed to grab hold of her and tear off a piece of her dress. Alicia fell to the floor and began to scream in despair. She cursed at her dress and shouted that she had almost been caught because of it. What surprised her next was that the crowd of angry Nyx minions just rushed at her but couldn't do anything to her. Finally, she realized that her power had created a kind of barrier and protection for Alicia from the attackers. This fact made the girl very happy and she thought about how to proceed. For herself, she decided that the only thing they would be able to get from her was this scrap of cloth that they managed to tear from her clothes. The attackers could only stand and continue calling the girl names and threatening her. Alicia was once again under the protection of Ophelia's divine power, and she understood it well. But the heroine was not going to thank her stepsister for this. Then she decided to take advantage of the moment and turn to the men as if they were fools to ask them one question. She wondered why they were so desperate to become servants of the god Arpho, since he obviously wouldn't share his dark power with them. Already after her, they began to shout and threaten her to watch her language and that the dark god would punish her for it. After managing to escape from them, Alicia was surprised to herself. How did she still manage to use the force without any knowledge? But then she realized that she would be able to escape from here only if she remembered how it was according to the plot of the book, no matter how much she didn't want to. She remembered that there must be a spring at the end of this tunnel. That was the information in that novel. That place, where a knight named Norman Diaz sits, who is capable of destroying the entire universe with his power. According to the plot of the book, Ophelia again began to use her divine power, which returned to her after the death of Alicia. And it was with her help that she wanted to free the knight from his water trap. Alicia decided to outrun her and use Norman to escape. But in the meantime, she was alarmed by the fact that she did not see such a spring nearby that could contain a whole man. Here she felt that she had stepped into something wet and wondered what it could be. 
Right in front of her, she saw the same source where the night was. But in fact, it looked more like a puddle than a spring. The girl reassured herself that it was necessary to check him better first. Alicia started going further into him, but it still wasn't as deep as it should be for a grown man to fit. She stubbornly walked further, until suddenly she began to fall rapidly down into the water. The heroine guessed that it was actually a trap and scolded herself. She flew down until she saw the same night, Norman Diaz. The young man impressed her so much with his appearance that she thought he was a pervert Nix trapped him here because of his good looks. Alicia kept her eyes on him and noted that it was the first time she had seen such a handsome boy. He seemed so young to her that she thought time had simply stood still for him here. Alicia became so interested in the stranger that she instantly forgot why she was looking for him in the first place. At that moment, she was guided only by instincts. But she was able to stabilize her feelings and decided with a cool head that to begin with, he still needed to be released. After swimming the distance with him, she collapsed tiredly. It occurred to her that she needed to improve her physical condition because she was too weak to save anyone at all. The heroine accused the young man that he was too heavy and she even wanted to throw him there. Norman Diaz continued to lie down and did not even open his eyes. Here, Alicia was already tense. She began to worry, but didn't he die at some point? Finally, she heard his breathing and realized that the young man was alive. In her thoughts, she compared him to a sleeping beauty, or rather a prince. Then the girl began to shake him and address him as Mr. Norman. She said her name was Alicia Melfont, began to persuade him to open his eyes because she needed his help so much. But not seeing a reaction from him, she already began hysterically waking him up. The girl said that they needed to run quickly before that lover of darkness found them. Suddenly, Alicia was forced to turn her head to the side and look for a voice. It was Crazy Nix, who asked where she hides Ophelia. Confused, the girl asked what he meant. As he drew closer to her, she reminded him that Ophelia was dead. Next, Nix leaned over to Alicia and told her that she was lying because he could feel her sister's power. He even touched the girl to make sure that the divine power was really near. The heroine guessed that he could really feel Ophelia's power when she activated it and used it to escape. Something else suddenly caught Nix's attention and he looked surprised. He saw Norman Diaz lying on the floor and asked Alicia how she managed to free him. He could not believe that it was Alicia who could do it. Nix was sure that it was Ophelia. She came here to free Norman. Finally, without thinking, Alicia did what she had dreamed of for a long time. She powerfully hit Nix. In this way, she showed that she had the divine power that he so needed and sought. Enraged with anger, Alicia confessed to Nix that Ophelia had used the remnants of her powers to seal him away, then resurrected her. She also added that she now keeps her powers within herself. Nix's face was twisted with despair, and he refused to believe what was being said. The heroine carefully observed the emotions of the servant of the Dark God. She happily said that now he felt what she felt for so long. Nix, who was in a fit of anger, began to call the girl insulting words and said that Ophelia's divine power could not be used by people like her. Alicia looked like a winner and teased him that now he wouldn't be able to kill her. Nix's eyes were full of pity and despair. He understood that by killing Alicia, he would also damage the power he needed so much. He refused to believe it. The boy shouted that Ophelia was chosen by God, so she could not die so easily. Finally, he was able to grab the heroine's leg. Nix called the girl a liar and decided that she had deceived him. Alicia screamed that she only hit him with divine power, so he should believe her. Here she heard a voice commanding Nix that this girl should be killed, and then Ophelia would return. The guy asked the heroine if she heard these words, but he said that it was the voice of his god Arfo. Nix stated that he only needed to kill the girl, and then everything would fall into place. With crazy eyes, he shouted that she had no idea what he needed this power for. Not letting go of the girl's throat, the dark servant said that the precious energy had already begun to flow out of her, so she was not worthy of her. Alicia, to die in agony, Melfont was very happy about this. The girl resisted as best she could. She did not believe that she could die here so easily. Suddenly, she heard strange noises and saw Nix being spun by some unknown force. Alicia finally felt free and did not understand what had happened. Norman Diaz was standing next to her and said that she was now safe. The heroine saw a holy barrier, the power of which now saved her. Now she understood why Nix had taken off so abruptly. But in front of her eyes was the crazy and scary face of the attacker, and in her head she heard his voice calling her to him and threatening that she would never be able to escape from him. Then Alicia pulled back sharply and rudely sent Nix away. 
and Nick sat, bound by some kind of energy, and shouted that he was giving the girl a chance to sacrifice herself to the Dark God. The heroine came to the conclusion that the attacker was hunting for her body all this time. Norman, who was watching everything, asked the stranger who this man was and did he want to harm her. Alicia replied that it was a fallen priest who killed all the members of the Melfont family and sacrificed them to the dark god Arfo. She urged that he should not be left alive. The guy asked if she was a daughter of the Melfont family. The heroine sadly answered that she once was, but added that now she is the head of her new kind. At that moment, they saw how Nix managed to get up and shouted to Alicia. The young people defended themselves from Nix, who almost broke the protective barrier. Alicia turned to Norman and stuttered, asking him to protect her. Norman replied that he was sorry, but he did not have enough strength to face the dark minion right now. But he added hopefully that he could buy some time for them. Then they heard the voice of Nix, who urged Norman to surrender because soon their barrier will fall. He also shouted that he would tear the night apart and sacrifice the blood to the dark god. The dark minion was getting closer and closer to them. Alicia was in despair and decided in her mind that this was the end of them. Norman rushed towards Nix. The heroine stood motionless and remembered the events described in the book. According to the plot of the novel, Norman Diaz was a holy knight and had a power that could upset the balance in the universe. This young man predicted her death in the book and reminds her of the imminent danger in the future. But he is also her only savior, Alicia thought. Norman warned the girl that they urgently need to get out of here. Alicia couldn't help but look at Nix's monster. He lay chained to the ground, but still threatened Alicia with a look. In her head, she heard that she would still suffer. The voice in her head also said that death would find her, and this brought the girl into a state of shock. Then she stubbornly shouted that it was all lies and manipulation, and she would not sit idly by and wait for danger. And in her head, she continued to hear that she was only a vessel for Ophelia's divine power. Norman realized that the girl was being tormented by voices inside and begged her to resist it, because in this way he wanted to influence her and make her more vulnerable. He reassured Alicia and said that he believed in her, because for him she was already a hero who saved him. The guy apologized and once again emphasized that they had to go. Then he took her in his arms and swore that he would save her. Nix remained on the floor, but did not stop trying to send voices into Alicia's head. The young people left that place, but in their wake, a voice warned them that the dark god Arfo would still lead them to hell. Ophelia opened her eyes and began to scream. A man approached her who addressed her by name. A young man named Nicholas Diaz, who was the second son of the Diaz family, asked the girl how she was feeling. Ophelia recognized the young man and asked how long she had been missing and how many days had passed since the festival. Nicholas replied that it had been less than a day and assured the girl not to worry, because Nix could not get what he wanted. He added that they still had time before he killed Alicia. Ophelia scolded herself for being unconscious at a time when everyone needed her. Nix's hiding place while Ophelia rested. But the girl replied that there was no time for that and she had to go. Then the boy denied that they still don't even know where he can sit. Ophelia confidently answered that this place is Tantaros. Nicholas asked another knight if they had ever heard the name Tantaros. He replied that he had never heard such a thing before. The girl said that she could not explain because this name and the location of the citadel suddenly came to her head. Nicholas listened carefully because he knew that Ophelia had a strong premonition and was never wrong. It was there he hoped that he would find clues as to where Norman might be. He also hoped that he was waiting for him, so he decided to go and order Jack to prepare for the journey. Meanwhile, Alicia was flying somewhere with Norman. She did not understand if it was a dream or reality. The young man asked the girl to close her eyes for one minute. Alicia thought that it was difficult for her to do this when he was so close. Finally, they landed on the ground. Norman asked the beauty if she was injured. She replied that she thought it was fine. But here Alicia was covered by memories of how she was in danger not long ago. She realized that she had been so focused on saving her life that she had completely forgotten how he was attacking her with his demonic power. It dawned on her that this monster had ruined everything. Norman tried to stabilize Alicia and bring her back to the present. The girl couldn't get rid of the fragments from that night and screamed that she was in pain and it was difficult to breathe. At that moment, she remembered how Nix had mercilessly strangled her. The young man just started screaming hysterically for her to come to her senses. He realized that she was gasping for breath from the shock and horror of what she had experienced. The knight held her and promised that he would not let her die here. 
Norman decided to loosen the lacing on her dress so that the girl could breathe more easily. Before that, he apologized for his possibly dubious actions. Finally, Alicia opened her eyes and confidently looked ahead. The young man asked if she got better, and she asked if she is still alive. Norman nodded affirmatively and added that she was alive for as long as she could now. Alicia did not look happy, but rather confused. She understood that everything did not go according to the plot of the book. Nix could not kill her. Having already moved away from the shock, the girl threw herself into Norman's arms and was glad that she got out of there alive. He replied that now she is safe and everything will be fine. Alicia remembered the threats that she would not be able to escape death forever, so she wondered if she could rewrite the tragic ending. Norman invited her to lean on his manly shoulder. He assumed that all she needed now was sleep. Meanwhile, Nicholas and Ophelia got to the Citadel. They wondered why everything around was in ruins. Jack turned to the captain and informed him that they had found the priest of the heretics and that he was lying crushed under the slabs. Ophelia asked to bring a priest to seal him urgently. Nicholas ordered the knight to show the way. Ophelia hoped that when Nix was sealed, they would know all the information. She also mentally noted that something had changed, but she did not understand what. Alicia and Norman were resting. The young man noted that the world has not changed at all. He regretfully admitted that now he must be the head of the family because he is the only one left alive. The young man continued to wonder how much had happened while he was asleep. He had a picture of his little brother screaming in his head, but he thought that they must all be in a lot of pain. He blamed only himself for everything. Memories washed over him. He remembered the first time he had told Zoe his full name, Norman Diaz, to a friend. His interlocutor was surprised by the sound of his name. Zoe was a name prefix given by God himself and used only in the family. Then a long time ago, Norman revealed his name to his friend Iago, because in fact he already considered him a brother. They went through a lot together. He also admitted then to Iago that he is like a family member to him. But despite the fact that they were together in every difficult battle, the moment came when Norman asked him a direct question to his face, because he did not expect such meanness from him. Iago immediately went mad and began to call upon death to come for his enemy Norman Diaz Zoe. Norman realized too late how blind he had been, unable to see his friend's true intentions and hatred for him. The boy remembered that he himself once told a secret to Iago, and he imposed an ancient curse, but he also needed the real name of the victim. Norman begged him not to do this and to let the boy go. He warned that a loving spell only makes the caster worse. Iago looked completely mad. He said that he hated Norman from the first time they met. He added that life would be wonderful without Norman. Iago wished his former comrade dead and urged him to surrender first. Then he pressed the boy to him even more, and he screamed to be let go. Then a boy named Nicholas activated his divine power and thus saved Norman, who was already little by little reduced to ashes. Norman was under the influence of the curse for some time. He heard Iago's cries of how much he hated him and wished him dead. He remembered how he had befriended and trusted Iago for many years, and all this time he just dreamed that he would die. He also heard the screams of Nicholas in his head, begging him not to let him go and not to leave him here. Being under the influence of the curse, Norman was just waiting for the end, but he didn't really want to die, until he heard the voice of a beautiful stranger who whispered to him to hold on and not die. Returning to the present, Norman looked closely at the sleeping Alicia, he heard some inexplicable sounds like a moan from her. The young man tensed a little. Next, he decided to touch her forehead to check. Alicia seemed too hot to him. Norman decided that action was needed. He understood that his power might not be very effective, but he had no other choice. He tried to activate his divine power. The boy realized that the girl is now very weak and does not feel well. He guessed that Alicia had pulled him out of the lake with such injuries on his body, and he wasn't that light. Norman thought that the girl was so afraid of death that she was able to walk such a long and difficult way. It also occurred to the knight that Alicia was not driven by fear, but rather by the desire to live. He became interested in finding out what kind of person she was and decided that he would be able to learn more about the girl when she woke up. Norman couldn't remember the last time he'd been so worried. Everything that happened now became possible only because Alicia became a victim. The girl made sure that her hands were still in place. It even surprised her. Looking at her hands again, she realized that she was not dead. She already announced in a joyful voice that she was alive. Alicia cursed that book and the story it told. She saw something that alarmed and surprised her at the same time. The girl saw the bed and realized it in her voice. 
She remembered only the escape from Tantaros, and all other memories were very vague. Alicia got nervous and started screaming that she couldn't remember anything at all. She wondered where she was and what kind of place it was. Finally, a young man appeared at the door and happily announced that he had returned. A strange picture opened before the boy's eyes, and he heard the question, Who is he? Out of surprise, the young man dropped the basket of fruit from his hands. Alicia pounced on another man and demanded to confess who he was. She believed that he was Nix's minion and threatened that he would not be able to deceive her. The man shouted that he was just old. Shocked, Norman began to calm the girl and said that these are only good people who sheltered them. Alicia didn't trust Norman. She believed that strangers could not do it just like that. The old man excused himself and said that he saw how unkempt their clothes were, so he understood that they had no money. The girl said she did not understand what he meant. In fact, there was only one ball on her. She was dressed in her grandmother's nightgown and she was completely bossy. And she also had a wedding ring on it, which could not be sold. While Alicia mourned her silk dress and jewels, Norman apologized to his old masters for his companion's actions. Norman thanked her for her understanding and explained that she had been through a lot. The owners got into position and told the boy that he was very kind. Left alone, Norman told Alicia that he guesses that she doesn't understand anything now. He explained that he thought he would have time to return before the girl woke up and then tell her everything. He expressed his joy at seeing a girl who had already fully recovered and came to her senses. They noticed that the wounds on her hands had disappeared. Alicia asked how it was that she recovered so quickly. Norman didn't know what to say when he heard the question about his divine power. Instead of answering, the young man offered the girl a snack. He said that he brought apples from the forest across the street because they have no money, so they will eat like this for the time being. He held out the apple and assured that it was not poisonous. Alicia accepted the fruit and turned to Mr. Norman. The heroine dared to ask who changed her clothes when she was unconscious. Norman was not confused and answered that it was an old lady, the owner of the house. He added that her clothes were wet and dirty. The girl was nervous, but agreed with this answer. Alicia continued to ask. She was worried about the question of where they are and how much time has passed since their escape. She also mentioned Nick's. Norman was surprised when he heard his name and asked again. Alicia reminded him that it was about that vile priest that Norman had fought. She demanded some information about him. Norman admitted that Nix had received a powerful blow filled with divine power. But he added that it will most likely paralyze him for a while, several weeks or even more. Norman expressed his sadness that he couldn't finish him off then. The fact is that while he was under the curse, he lost a lot of strength. Alicia noticed that the young man talked about everything with a smile on his face, and this alarmed her. Norman informed the girl that she had overslept two days after escaping from the Citadel. The girl was surprised because she thought that she was not asleep, but lost consciousness. The young man said that he carried her in this state through the forest until they reached a village. This place is called Thule. Alicia mentioned that the village of Thule is located on the border of the Empire and the East Coast. Having a good orientation in the area, the girl guessed that this place is not so far from the headquarters of the Romdak Guild, so they can easily return to the Empire. Norman turned to the girl and asked permission to ask one question. Alicia agreed. The boy asked how the heroine knew that he was in that lake. Alicia looked alarmed and was silent for a while. Norman admitted that he was worried about several points. He did not understand why the girl saved him, and even to this day he does not know her name. The heroine hesitated to tell him what she had read about him in a book. Alicia began to imagine that she had heard how the first son of the Diaz family had simply disappeared a long time ago. She went on to say that she had found him in this lake in Tantaros. Intuition seemed to immediately tell the girl that he was the very first son of the Diaz family. Norman did not give up and continued the interrogation. He wondered why Nix had sealed him and kidnapped the girl. Alicia replied that Nix is trying to become the successor of the dark god Arfo and is doing everything for it. It is known that Arfo gave the universe the seven deadly sins thousands of years ago. People started killing each other with the help of dark forces. Myera, the goddess of life, could not see the death of her children in whom she invested divine power, so she struck the demon and sealed him away. Also, the goddess Myra hid the dark curses of Arfo in the pages of a secret tome so that her children would forget this horror forever. This folio was placed by the people in the far corner of the temple to be buried there for a long time. But Nix, who had a strong divine power, was able to quickly find this secret tome. He shouted for the minions to release their hatred and called to curse all enemies. 
People listen to him say that this is the only path that leads to true liberation. For Priest Nix, the magic of Arfo's curse and the power it gives was a very strong temptation. After he defeated Norman, he planted him in his lair. It was like his trophy, which he had won for the first time as a servant of the god Arfo. Alicia knew the whole story and considered herself a fairly honest person. But she admitted that she could not tell the young man to his face that he was a living trophy of a demon. Instead, she said that Nix used divine power to seal Norman and his curse away, then went to Melfonte Manor. She added that until that moment, he was a priest of Mara. The girl knew all this thanks to the book. Nix gained dark powers after sacrificing the people of Melfonte Manor. The heroine continued the story and reported that at the end, Ophelia struck Nix, but his successors resurrected him. The girl said that after he came back to life, he immediately sought out Alicia and kidnapped her. Norman was shocked by what he heard and expressed regret for the loss of the girl. Alicia replied that it was all in the past and asked if her story helped him. The young man thanked and said that a lot had happened in the last ten years. He said that the owner of the house told him that the Lawton Empire was founded 500 years ago and that this date will be celebrated. Norman remembered his brother Nicholas and assumed that he must have grown up. The young man felt guilty that the boy must have worried about him all these years. He clarified that Nicholas is his dear younger brother. Alicia asked if it was about Nicholas Diaz and said that she had seen him several times in the evenings. Norman was very excited and started asking the girl about him. The girl replied with satisfaction that he was doing well. In her mind, she understood the reason for this because he was courting Ophelia. She said Norman would be surprised at how his brother has grown. But she did not want to tell him that, in fact, he had become an arrogant fool. The young man beamed with happiness and said that he could not wait for the meeting. Alicia replied that she was very happy for him. Then Norman asked the girl her name because she never gave it. The heroine waited for the right moment and presented herself in full. She said her name is Alicia and she is the head of the Melfont family and the Romdak Trade Guild. In Melfonte Manor, the servant delivered the letter to Mrs. The lady's name was Erica and she was Alicia's secretary. The message was sent on behalf of the paladins. The letter informed the lords of the kingdom about the latest events related to the riots in Lothan. It was also said that during the expedition to the western borders of the kingdom, Tantares was found, which was the hiding place of Nyx. The sender reported that traces of a heretic killing people and sacrificing them to the dark god Arfo were seen inside. It was reported that when they arrived at the site, Tantares was already in ruins, and Nyx, who was unconscious, was picked up by temple servants to be resealed. Unfortunately, the whereabouts of the young lady who was kidnapped at the festival is still unknown. In the letter, it was written that some followers of Nixa managed to escape, so they advised to avoid any communication with the followers of certain religious organizations if possible. Erica, after reading the letter, said that it was signed by Nicholas Diaz, a representative of the Paladins. The maid asked, frightened, what should they do now? Erica assumed that Lady Alicia was not in Thanataris, so either they killed her and hid her body before the arrival of the Paladins. The secretary girl expressed the hope that the lady could have escaped. Alicia examined the plate of food. Finally, she began to eat. Norman offered the girl to bring a warm drink. The heroine was amazed, because she knew very little about him from the novel and did not think what he was really like. She recalled how the young man encouraged her to resist and supported her, telling her that she would make it. He called the girl a hero who saved him, so she has the strength to survive all this. Alicia decided that Norman was extremely cute. At lunch, the girl began to analyze what had happened. She remembered that she was kidnapped on the first day of the festival and thrown into the dungeon of Tantaros. She was unconscious for the next two days, so it turned out that the heroine left the Melfont estate three days ago. Alicia reflected that she had used that time to change the ending of the book, but she is still unsure if she can stop her death. In her mind, the heroine scolded herself for the fact that her absence for such a long time was putting the life of her little nephew at risk. She guessed that Cousin Gale would try to become Alfred's guardian because he had long been interested in the fortunes of the Melfont family. Alicia was also troubled by her foolish fiancé, Philip Morfolk, who could steal the family's money and run off with his lover. The girl was worried about Alfred, who could become an easy prey for anyone who wanted their money. At one time, she also remained alone among the greedy nobles who revealed their true colors. Alicia decided to leave in order to prevent those brats from acting. To begin with, she thought of going to the nearest city, where her guild Ramdak was located. When the question arose about the money for this trip, Alicia mentioned her precious earrings. 
But the girl understood that in such a state she could not go alone, so she went to talk to the owners of the house. She apologized and asked if they could recommend any mercenaries who would be willing to cooperate without a subscription. In response, the married couple asked what would happen to her husband, to which the girl was very surprised. Alicia cursed as she saw Norman return to the house. The young man asked. Maybe she was hungry while calling Alicia her love. Without thinking, the girl answered that she had just eaten three buns, and only then did she realize how he addressed her. The guy invited the girl to go to their room. The owners of the house were amused by them, because it was youth and love. Left alone, Norman apologized to the young lady for his inappropriate behavior. Alicia replied that it was even better, because they would have a lot of questions about why they were traveling together. The girl warned the young man that she was quite a well-known person. Therefore, if her acquaintances see it, rumors will spread. Therefore, she offered to tell these elderly people the truth, because soon their paths will diverge altogether. Norman replied that they couldn't just part ways. Alicia asked in surprise the reason for this. The young man asked permission to accompany the girl to her estate. The heroine thought that it would not be so bad if there was a person nearby who could protect her. But she was least worried about personal safety. The most important thing for her was to regain control of her estate. Time was short, and Norman could have prevented Alicia from doing so in her mind. She thought the return of Diaz's first son would bring a lot of attention to them. The girl was sure that the crowd would gather even to look at his cute face. And she didn't need that at all. But Norman worried the girl anyway, because he was a reminder that the curse described in the book still exists. So Alicia dared to tell him that he was making her uncomfortable. At first, Norman couldn't find anything to answer and just stared with his angelic gaze. Then he began to plead with them to stop pretending to be man and woman and promise to be careful in public. Alicia replied that the young man did not understand her at all. She reported that she had rebuilt the Melfont estate in 10 years while working as a common trader. The girl explained that their power depends on work and income and not on origin. She also added that they chose survival instead of being aristocrats. The heroine was sure that everyone would welcome Norman with joy, but for her, everything would be different. She believed that people would accept him Alicia as the Melfont witch, and this will make them hunt her. Norman lowered his eyes and admitted that he understood what she was talking about. He explained that he did not immediately see how the world had changed over these ten years. Alicia was worried that he was offended by her. The guy offered to summarize what the girl said earlier. He understood that she must urgently return to the Melfont estate, because there are people who are hunting for her fortune. But if she goes with him, everyone who cares will pay attention to it. He added that this could delay her return to Melfont. But from her words, he understood that she was also worried that there would be many rumors about them. Then, Norman offered to tell her the advantages that she would receive if she did not refuse his escort. The confused girl agreed to listen to him. The first son of Diaz said that he is currently the best bodyguard for her, because she will not find anyone stronger and more durable than him. He admitted that he was in the best physical shape ten years ago when he was imprisoned. He added that due to some reasons, his body did not change on a physical level. Alicia saw it as bragging. Norman convinced the girl and said that he was much stronger than any mercenary for money. But he self-confidently pretended that he saw her consent and her silence spoke about it. Secondly, according to him, he had experience both in direct confrontations and in special secret operations. But for this... He only needs an ordinary hood, which will hide him in the crowd. He admitted that he had already done this when he bought pastries for them at the local market, but no one even paid attention to him. The girl was in thought, and the young man continued to pelt her with arguments. Another was that he would be able to handle any emergency and get her out of harm's way quickly. Norman said he could be an actor in the right situation, such as a loving husband. Alicia demanded that he stop already because she understood everything. The girl agreed to believe that he is as handsome and smart as he skillfully tells. The young man denied because, in his opinion, these were all facts. Alicia invited him to stand in her place and listen from the outside, how everything he said was perceived. Norman worried he hadn't been convincing enough. The girl said that this is not true, but she stands by her opinion. Although she was very curious why he was so eager to go with her, the young man replied that he was a paladin of the Lotan Empire and his duty was to protect the children of the goddess. Alicia said to this that if he is Mayera's heir, then he can just go to the slums. But the first son Diaz did not stop. He said that he owed her his life. The heroine replied that anyone could save him from that lake, 
but the boy added that she also saved his soul. Alicia asked in surprise. Norman began to explain and said that his body was indeed trapped in the lake, but his soul sank deeper and deeper into the abyss, beyond the borders of the physical body. Alicia asked again, did she not feel like an abyss? The young man said that it was his personal desire to accompany her as the savior not only of his body, but also of his soul, to the Melfont estate. But he admitted that he dreams of seeing her return to her rightful place, so he once again begged her to give him a chance. Finally, Alicia agreed to give him this chance. Norman happily turned to the young lady, but the girl immediately broke the idol and set a condition that they should sign a protection contract. This did not surprise the boy. She said she agreed with what he said earlier, but in her opinion, there are still some risks and moments that need to be recorded. She urged playing it safe for both of them. Seeing Norman's confusion, Alicia asked if he agreed. But the young man began to laugh and apologize because the whole thing was in the words she said before that. This made the girl angry, and she did not understand what was funny here. Norman tried to explain that it is not so easy to find a person who understands the world so well. The heroine asked if this means that she should make a contract as she wanted. The boy objected and said that they should do it together to take into account the interests of both parties. At sunset, the young people thanked their hosts for their hospitality and promised to repay them in kind if necessary. In response, the elderly wished them a good journey. The contract was drawn up by Party A, Alicia Melfont, and Side B, Norman Diaz. Norman advised the young lady to relax and behave more naturally so as not to attract attention. The contract stated that Party A was to pay Party B after they arrived at the Melfont estate. The amount will depend on the number of days worked. The young man remarked that as a real married couple, they should hold each other's hands. Another clause in the contract was that Party A should comply with Party B's requests for masking when necessary. Suddenly, the girl leaned over Norman and explained that she needed to help him cover his face. The parties to the contract also agreed that Party B should hide his body and face on the street. On the way, they met many suspicious people, which worried the newlyweds. Norman admits that Alicia was right about the contract, and he is glad he agreed to sign it. The contract stipulated that Party B must protect Party A at the cost of their lives, and this is reinforced by the honor of Mara's paladin. The girl saw Norman's excessive excitement and began to calm him down, because, in her opinion, it was an ordinary passerby. The heroine recognized the market square of Thula, which was on the way to Katam, and decided that they were already there. They went to a local jeweler, who was looking at the earring in surprise. He asked if they wanted to sell this ornament. The man said that the maximum price he could offer was just one gold. Alicia freaked out and shouted that the gem in this earring was bought from the Romdak Guild and polished by the best craftsmen in the Imperial City. She asked if he really offered only one gold for that. The jeweler asked if they were from Romdaku. The girl said that if that was all he had to offer, she would accept. At the same time, Alicia threatened that this would be his last deal with them, because Ramdak would not deliver his goods to him. The man replied that only for her sake he would raise his rate to the market level. The heroine understood that she was able to learn all the tricks of the trade, because she herself worked in this field in order to restore the Melfont estate. She was worried about the villagers who could not return to their homes because there were only ruins. People sympathized with her and felt sorry that she had to go through a lot. The girl admitted that she was responsible for the servants and workers who were lucky enough to stay alive. The heroine remembered how one day she appeared before those people and introduced herself on behalf of the Romdak Guild. Alicia was a helpless girl from a noble family who even traveled around the estate in a carriage with guards. She recalled the times when she was humiliated. Customers asked if this wine was drinkable at all and demanded that she try it first. Wherever she went as a trader, men laughed and asked, Who is this Romdak? They said in disbelief that this was a new trade guild that had been created by a single aristocrat. But Alicia didn't have time to feel sorry for herself, because she didn't want to be hungry, so she had to work and do everything. One day, a servant saw a young lady in a rather strange position on the floor and asked if she was all right. Alicia sat on her knees and screamed that she had managed to do it. The frightened worker once again tried to ask if everything was okay. Alicia announced that they finally agreed to buy their product. The heroine recalled that she was then able to stand on her feet and help her people because she did not pay attention to such concepts as honor and dignity, which she considered completely delusional. The young people received the funds, and Norman asked Alicia why she was so pensive. Did anything happen to her? She hoped that the owner was a real talker. The man asked what else he could be useful to young people. 
Alicia admitted that there will definitely be rumors about her, and she dreams that they will play into her hand. She asked to tell everyone that Ramdak's head was back and that she, Alicia Melfont, headed for Katam. As soon as they sat down at the bar, Alicia sighed and said it had been a long day. Norman was worried that they didn't have enough money to rent a room. The girl offered to find a place to spend the night on loan. But at the same time, she was worried about the reputation of the guild. She decided that they needed to make a place to rest in the open air until they arrived in Katam. Her guild members will help them there. In addition, Alicia believed that money should be spent only on quality service and conditions. Norman suggested that trading cities such as Katam attracted criminals. He added that a messenger should be sent to the girls' knights so that they would know of her arrival. Alicia lamented that there were no knights near Melfonte Manor. She said that ten years ago, on that terrible night, all their knights were executed. But no one wants to swear allegiance to their house on that mutilated land. Norman was stunned by this news. The young lady said that everything was fine and even without the knights, they were able to bloom again. She added that it is all thanks to Ramdak. The heroine remembered how she asked the shop owner to tell everyone that Ramdak's head had returned, and she felt a little ashamed of it. Norman asked Alicia how she came to the field of trade. The girl replied that it was all thanks to the lotus flowers. The guy asked again. She said that an epidemic came to their land at that time, which destroyed the entire crop. And when she thought all was lost, she noticed something. They were lotus flowers on the lake. Lotus leaves were used to brew tea, and the stalks were used as fuel. But Alicia understood that the sale of tea and fuel was not enough to restore the Melfont estate. And then they invented making wine from lotus flowers, which was a much more profitable commodity. It was supposed to be a unique wine from the Melfont house. The girl proudly announced that they had become the first aristocratic family in history to create their own trade guild. She admitted that it was only thanks to their strict trade policy that they were able to acquire such great fortunes. Then they started investing in other areas to get more profits. These were land, jewels, real estate. They were staffed by soldiers who were supposed to protect their workers and merchant fleet. Alicia painfully admitted that she was a heartless witch for everyone, but she gave up honor and reputation in order to return the family fortune. Now Norman understood why she was so young and already so well-versed in the world, and why she reacted so sharply to rumors. The young man tried to calm the girl down and said that he believes that making a profit for the sake of saving many people is much more noble than just honor and dignity. Alicia admitted that she stopped paying attention to her honor and dignity a long time ago. Other visitors recognized the girl and began to whisper whether it was the head of Romdak who was killed at the festival. They rejoiced at the fact that she suffered so much then and were surprised that she was so resilient. The man at the next table claimed that he would always be able to recognize her purple eyes. He blamed them on the guild, with the help of which they want to reach Katam. Young people continued to sit and listen to disparaging judgments about Alicia. Voices said that she, as an aristocrat, should sit at home and drink tea, and as if she has no right to prevent them from receiving their profit. Alicia thought with pain that they were not wrong, and she was ready for any kind of insult. The girl admitted that she is a strong competitor for other traders, but even among the nobles she was a stranger. The heroine called herself an aristocrat who sells wine. The man next to him said that it didn't matter who she was because the goddess didn't treat her well. Another of the company at the next table said that he had heard a story about the Melfont family, and he was sure that many ghosts were hunting them. Alicia was worried about Norman's condition when they heard the men wishing her dead. After all, this sleeping prince simply does not tolerate insults. She tried to calm him down and advised him to ignore any rumors as she was used to them. Norman replied that this was not true. The heroine began to scream, addressing her companion who was in a strange state. He shouted hysterically that everything was not right at all, not a drop. A commotion and a fight broke out in the bar. The girl calmly looked at all this and thought that they are like dogs, they can only bark without resistance. But she was also worried that the fight in the tavern might turn into a problem for them. Alicia begged Norman to stop, because she was afraid that he might kill the insolent stranger. She tried to convince her companion that everything was really okay. Norman did not give up and continued to argue that this was not the case. He clarified that all is not well with the girl. Alicia persuaded the young man to leave, and he continued to tease the man and said that he would teach him to be responsible for his words. The heroine asked Norman not to complicate the situation and called him a stupid fool. Soon they saw the friends of the man Norman was beating start to come at them with threats for his rude behavior with them. Alicia shouted nervously to the young man that they had to go, 
otherwise she would leave him here. The men started shouting that the newlyweds were leaving and urged them to run after them. Norman ran after the young lady and warned her that she was having trouble breathing. He asked if she was sure that everything was fine. Alicia was mentally angry with the young man. She didn't understand why he was so worried about her for no reason, because it was a violation of their contract. She decided to deduct from his salary for these indiscretions. And this, in her opinion, will be even little compared to the damage he caused. The sleeping prince continued to persuade the young lady to walk more slowly because she might get sick. Alicia not jokingly exclaimed that she was already tired of his constant commotion. She asked if Norman didn't like something and wanted to hit her. The frightened young man assured that it was not so and there was no need for it. She reminded him that the first son of the Diaz family does not tolerate insults, so he does not understand what is preventing him from hitting her now. Norman began apologizing for his behavior in the tavern. He added that it is the business of every paladin to punish those who allow ignorance towards others. Alicia screamed that what was the point? She said those fools are right. The heroine clarified that everything is so, because she, Alicia Melfont, is a disgrace to the aristocracy. She traded her dignity for money. Norman replied that he could not agree with the terrible words they were saying. He also does not believe what the curse told him. Alicia remained silent in surprise and did not dare to start questioning him. Norman admitted that in that lake he constantly heard voices demanding his death. In the tavern, he tried to ignore those people, but it didn't work. He once again remembered the words he had heard there. The men believed that Alicia was to die that day with her family. He was already going through constant insults that did not stop for a moment. He was also wished dead at one time. The boy began to get used to the thought that he had to die. But soon, it was not strange voices, but Norman himself who tried to kill himself, his own eye. Norman admitted that Alicia is a very nice person unlike him. But at the same time, he believed that it didn't matter how strong she was. After all, the wounds from the offensive words of other people do not go away by themselves. He persuaded Alicia not to allow herself to be treated like that. The girl agreed. She promised not to humiliate herself, but instead asked Norman to get a hold of himself. The young man answered with satisfaction that he promised not to behave like that again. Later, Alicia suggested that they should go to Katam through the forest so that those bandits would not find them. But she was not happy that they would have to spend the night on the street again. Norman remarked that the sky was quite starry today. Throwing his cloak over the girl's shoulders, he assured her that she would be able to admire the beautiful sky today in complete safety. Morning came, but Norman continued to sleep sweetly. The heroine crept up to him very quietly. He asked why she was looking at him like that. Alicia noticed that he was too alert. Norman replied that a guard should always be ready to meet the enemy. The girl clarified, did she hear correctly about the readiness to attack? She laughed and said that the young man slept so soundly and even snored. Looking at Norman's confusion, she reassured him that it was a joke. The young man noticed that the young lady was much more prepared for the long journey than he was. Alicia said that Norman flatters her, but she has some news. She happily announced that they would no longer wear out the soles of their shoes. Hiding in the bushes, young people saw an unfamiliar crew. Norman noticed that the flag of Romdak was hanging there. He said that it was a pleasant surprise for him that they came across members of her trade guild. The young man considered this help from heaven. Alicia replied that heaven was helping no one. At least she was sure of it. She surprised the young man by saying that she would still refuse to help. The heroine believed that only she could save herself. She stepped into the path in front of the carriage and started shouting for Stan to stop the carriage. Alicia shouted that she was sure he could hear her. The coachman warned the girl that she stood in the way of the woman Sten, who serves as the head of the Romdak Guild. The woman in the middle of the carriage gave the order to stop. Alicia and Norman continued to stand in silence. A woman Sten appeared in front of them, the acting head of the Romdak Guild. Stan started running. She threw herself into Alicia's arms. The alarmed woman began to cry and said that she was very worried because she thought they had lost a young lady. She asked Alicia if she had been watching her diet because she had lost so much weight. Alicia mentally recalled the abundance of baked goods. Norman thought happily that this elderly woman looked kind. Stan asked in surprise what was that glow next to them. She meant a very cute and handsome guy who was with Alicia. The woman whispered in the young lady's ear to leave that fool Philip Morfak and connect better with this guy. This angered the girl, but she corrected Philip's last name because he was a Morfolk. Alicia thought that she no longer needed a bodyguard because now she was under the supervision of Stan and the Knights. The woman continued to admire Norman, and the heroine worried that traveling with him could make things difficult for them. 
she dared to tell the sleeping prince that they had prepared everything so that he could return to his family as soon as possible. He looked puzzled and asked politely. Alicia confidently announced that it was time to break the contract. There was silence between the people in the carriage. Norman decided he couldn't just give up. Alicia did not want to behave in his angelic eyes. The heroine said that she would pay him according to the terms of the contract, but she would deduct one day when the fight in the tavern took place. She gives him a horse and carriage free of charge, but she asks them to separate where the road will divide. It was difficult for the girl to voice it, and she regretted that she could not just ignore him. Norman said he was very scared. He explained that the world has changed a lot in the last ten years, and he has become a complete stranger here. He was worried if he could find his way home on his own. Stan began to feel sorry for the boy. She said she was very sorry. The woman told him not to be afraid, because he can always go with them. Alicia begged Stan to stop. Norman asked the young lady if it was possible. Alicia was angry that she could not immediately refuse him, so as not to appear heartless in their eyes. She agreed on the condition that he would not go with them to Melfonte Manor. The young man nodded affirmatively. The girl noted that they should definitely part ways in Katami. The knight told Alicia's secretary Erica that they found her, and now she is at the hotel with Madame Stan. The girl clarified that it was not they who found her, but she found them. It is in the style of her highness. The knight suggested that perhaps they should go out to meet her in order to deliver the young lady safely. The secretary girl said that Madame Stan would be the best at it. Also, Alicia herself knows Cadam very well. Some voice asked where Alicia is now? Erica shouted that she ordered no one to let her in. It was a young man named Gano, and he was a representative of the trade guild. He said he asked to be told as soon as the young lady was found. The girl replied that she shouldn't have done it. She also noted that he should treat her with respect because she is his boss, not his friend. Gano said it was up to Alicia to decide, not her. He said he had to check on his boss after her workers whispered behind closed doors. He added that only she could free him from that slave contract. Erica freaked out and started yelling that he meant a legal employment contract, not a slave contract. Gano warned the secretary that he had not come here to argue with her. Then Erica ordered him to get out of there. She reminded that Lady Alicia is the head of the Romdak Guild, and she will return accompanied by her loyal staff. Gano said that he would bring her back here. The knight told Erica that this could become a real problem for them. The girl asked him what he was waiting for then. She ordered him to warn them quickly before this monkey reached the city. The events are transferred to Katam, to Alicia's apartment. Alicia was lying in her bed and was happy like a child. The heroine noted that this apartment is very different from her house, but a dry bed and a roof over her head is still better than spending the night on the street. She remembered Mr. Norman taking the utmost care of her safety and comfort during this trip. But then she mentally scolded herself for punishing herself, because he was just doing his job and would get paid for it. The heroine was worried about how she would inform him that he had to leave according to their previous agreement, because they were in Katam. Alicia referred to the contract and decided that a clause with a clear date should be added. She got dressed, went to a room in the apartment and knocked on it. The young lady persuaded herself that she was doing the right thing and needed to finish this matter. A surprised Norman opened the door. The young people looked at each other and no one dared to speak first. Madame Stan suggested that Norman wear a shirt to make sure how luxurious he would look in it. She promised that they would go around every boutique in Katama looking for similar things. Alicia asked, disgruntled, what is going on with them? The woman replied that she was just in time. Stan praised the young man and said that he looked like an angel. She believed that everything on it would look luxurious. The sleeping prince turned to the young lady and seemed to ask for help. Alicia warned Stan that his looks could be deceiving, as he was once a paladin commander. She said that it cannot be used as a mannequin. Norman wondered at the time, what was so suspicious about him? The woman shouted that such an appearance could open all doors for him, but instead he spent ten years in exile. She assumed that he had the right to receive all that he had not received during those years outside civilization. Alicia decided that Madame Stan had too much free time. The woman replied that now they all breathed a little, because the young lady had returned. The heroine adjusted herself that the leader should show everyone who is in charge here. She said she needed to discuss the details of the contract on behalf of the guild with Mr. Norman. But she added that she did not want them to be disturbed. The girl hinted that this applies even to Stan. The woman meekly agreed and asked to call her if she was needed. When they were alone, Norman noted that the young lady was acting perfectly. Alicia replied that it was all true. She reminded them that they had to discuss the details of the contract. 
Norman looked puzzled and just remained silent. The heroine announced that according to their contract, the young man should be provided with transport, some amount of money in cash and food. She added that with all this, he would be able to drive to the family estate. The girl said that it should be shipped in a week, and she added this clause to the contract. Alicia asked if he wanted to look at the changes. Norman continued to be silent, and the girl called him. He looked out the window and noticed that people outside were having fun. The girl looked out the window with him with interest. Together, they noted that even at such a time, the streets were crowded. Alicia clarified that they were celebrating the founding of the empire, and tonight they would be partying all night. Norman said sadly that people looked so happy from the outside. The heroine suggested that he must be knowledgeable about this annual festival, or he is reacquainting himself with the world after his long absence. She suggested that their guardian show him the area if he was interested in it. Norman happily clarified, but the heroine warned that he should hide his face. She said his family had already received a message that he was alive, and she had to deliver him unharmed. The boy swore he would be extra careful. He dared to ask if Alicia would go with him? The girl delicately replied that she had a lot of work to do. Norman replied that in that case, he would be forced to remind her of the terms of the contract. Stepping out onto the square, Alicia thought he'd hit her below the waist, and she had no choice but to agree to go out with him. The young man said that even with the latest changes, the contract still had a week to run. He added that he must always be with the girl as her bodyguard, according to the document. Norman admitted that he could not move calmly without the young lady. Alicia was nervous because, in her opinion, he obliged her to go with him. The boy took out a beautiful piece of jewelry and said that the purple color suited the heroine so well. Young people stood in the middle of the square, not hiding from anyone. They were being followed by a man with a dark, evil look. He turned to his master and said that he came here for this sinful soul. He hopes to see his will fulfilled. He also begged that the god Arfo be allowed to take her soul to hell. Alicia pressed herself against Norman and became nervous. The young man was also frightened by the number of people on the street at night. Norman suggested that the lady take his hand. She replied that she does not like to be touched. A man with scary eyes approached the young people. He ordered that Alicia Melfont followed him, but he added that he would call her to the depths of hell. Unexpectedly, Gano crept up to him and told him not to move, otherwise he would wring his neck. At this time, Alicia and Norman were calmly walking around the square. Gano tied up the stranger and wondered what kind of fool he was. He looked nervous because it was because of this old man that he couldn't keep up with the young people. The stranger raised his head and looked into Gano's eyes. The boy was very surprised by what he saw and he cursed. Before that, he met Ophelia in the square and asked what she was doing here. She told Gano to do as she said if he wanted Alicia to return to the estate safely.